Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark. And I'm Mark's partner, Alec. Tonight, we're going to have a friendly little competition to see who can relax you the most out of bedtime stories. And we're going to ask you to vote in the pinned comment at the top who did a better job making you feel relaxed. Like the comment that says Alec to vote for Alec. Or the comment that says Mark to vote for Mark. I've made a little spin wheel full of ASMR-related dares, and we'll read off all the items on the spin wheel at the end of the episode. By Friday, wherever the voting stands, we'll spin the wheel, and the person with less votes will have to do the dare. We'll include that in next week's video. Now, ASMR is meant to be relaxing, so please don't stress out about this competition. Neither of us will be offended we lose. We compete all the time, and I take losing really well. Yeah, he does. <laughs> um, also, if at any point you feel like our smooth, relaxing voices are just too much for you, please feel free to fall asleep. That's kind of the point of this video. You can come back to the video at any time to vote. Enjoy and vote Mark. <laughs> no, vote Alec. If you want, you can vote Alec, but you know, it's fine. Vote Mark. Hi, thank you for joining me. Tonight I'm gonna be reading John Muir's essay, Mountain Thoughts. The Sierra. Mountains holy as Sinai. No mountains I know are so alluring. None so hospitable, kindly, tenderly inspiring. It seems strange that everybody does not come at their call. They're given like the gospel without money and without price. Tis heaven alone that is given away. Here is calm so deep grasses cease waving. Wonderful how completely everything in wild nature fits into us. As if truly part and parent of us, the sun shines not on us but in us. The rivers flow not past but through us. Thrilling, tingling, vibrating every fiber and cell of the substance of our bodies, making them glide and sing. The trees wave and the flowers bloom in our bodies as well as our souls, and every bird song, wind song, and tremendous storm song of the rock in the heart of the mountains is our song and our very own and sings our love. The song of God sounding on forever, so pure and sure and universal is the harmony. It matters not where we are, where we strike in on the wild lowland plains. We care not to go to the mountains, and on the mountains we care not to go to the plains, but as soon as we are absorbed in the harmony, plain, mountain, calm, storm, lilies and sequoias, forests and meads, our only different strands of many colors. Are one in the sunbeam. What wonders lie in every mountain day? Crystals of snow, splash of small raindrops, hum of small insects, booming beetles, the jolly rattle of grasshoppers, chirping crickets, the screaming of hawks, jays, and clark crows the coo of cranes, 
the honking of geese, partridges drumming, trumpeting swans, frogs croaking, the whirring rattles of snakes, the awful enthusiasm of booming falls, the roar of cataracts, the crash and roll of thunder, earthquake shocks, the whisper of riddles soothing to slumber, the laugh of a wolf, the snorting of deer, explosive roaring of bears, the squeak of mice, the cry of the loon, loneliest, wildest of sounds, a fine place for feasting, if only one be poor enough. One is speedily absorbed into the spiritual values of things. The body vanishes and the freed soul goes abroad. Only in the roar of storms do these mighty solitudes find voice at all commensurate with their grandeur. The pines at the approach of the storms show eager expectancy, bowing, swishing, tossing their branches with eager gestures, roaring like lions about to feed, standing bent and round-shouldered like sentinels exposed. Sickness, pain, death. Yet, who could guess their existence in this fresh, abounding, overflowing life? This universal beauty. Race living on race. Killers killed, yet how little we see of the slaughter. How neatly, secretly, Decently is the killing done. I never saw one drop of blood, one red stain on all this wilderness. Even death is in harmony here. Only in shambles of the downy beds of homes is death terrible. Perhaps there is more pleasure than pain in natural death or even violent death. Livingston declared that the crushing of his arm by a lion was rather pleasurable than otherwise. Bloody Canyon, nature's darlings, are cared for and caressed even here, and protected by a thousand miracles in the very home and brooding places of storms. Faint are the marks of any kind of life, and at first you cannot see them or feel them at all, but here in the blessed water ousel, pleading, fluttering about amid the spray, and blending his sweet, small, human songs with those of the streams he loves so well. And many other birds who build their nests here the flowers with few leaves that bloom on the rocks as if fallen like snow from the sky. And here the grasshoppers jump and springs rattle as if to say, who is afraid? In the bumblebee singing every summer, the song sung a thousand. Nothing is more wonderful than to find smooth harmony in this lofty, cragged region where at first sight all seems so rough from any of the high standpoints, a thousand peaks, pinnacles, spires are seen thrust into the sky and so sheer and bare as to be inaccessible to wild sheep accessible only to the eagle. Any one by itself, harsh, rugged, crumbling, yet in connection with others seems like a line of writing along the sky. It melts into melody, one leading into another, keeping rhythm and time. 
The rock pavements seem as if carefully swept and dusted and polished every day. No wonder one feels a magic exhilaration when these pavements are touched, when the manifold currents of life that flow through the pores of the rocks are considered. They keep every crystal particle in rhythmic motion dancing. Books. I have a low opinion they are but piles of stone set up to show coming travelers where other minds have been, or at best signal smoke to call attention. Cadmus and all the other inventors of letters receive a thousandfold more credit than they deserve. No amount of word making will ever make a single soul to know these mountains. As well, seek to warm naked and frostbitten by lectures on caloric and pictures of flame. One day's exposure to mountains is better than cartloads of books. See how willingly nature poses herself upon photographer's plates. No earthly chemicals are so sensitive as those of the human soul. All that is required is exposure, the purity of material, the pure in heart shall see God. Water music. When in making our way through a forest, we hear the loud boom of a waterfall. We know that the stream is descending a precipice. If a heavy rumble and roar, then we know it is passing over a craggy incline, but not only are the existence and size of these larger characters of its channel proclaimed, but all the others. Go to the fountain canyons of the Merced. Some portions of this channel will appear smooth, others rough. Here a slope, there a vertical wall. Here a sandy meadow, there a lake bowl. And the young river speaks and sings all the smaller characters of the smooth slope. And downy hush of meadow as faithfully as it sings the great precipices of rapid inclines. So that anyone who has learned the language of running water will see its character in the dark. Beside the grand history of the glaciers and their own, the mountain streams sing the history of every avalanche and earthquake and of snow, all easily recognized by the human ear and every word evoked by the falling leaf and drinking deer, beside a thousand other facts so small and Spoken by the stream in so low a voice, the human ear cannot hear them. Thus, every event is written and spoken. The wing scars the sky, making a path inevitably as the deer in snow. And the winds all know it and tell it. the story. Team Mark. I will be reading a passage from the original Winnie the Pooh, published in 1926. Here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now. Bump, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels there really is another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. And then he feels that perhaps there isn't. Anyhow, here he is at the bottom and ready to be introduced to you, Winnie the Pooh. When I first heard his name, I said, just as you are going to say, but I thought he was a boy. So did I, said Christopher Robin. 
Then you can't call him Winnie. I don't. But you said he's Winnie the Pooh. Don't you know what the means? Ah, yes, now I do. I said quickly, and I hope you do too, because it's all the explanation you're going to get. Sometimes Winnie the Pooh likes a game of some sort when he comes downstairs, and sometimes he likes to sit quietly in front of the fire and listen to a story. This evening, what about a story, said Christopher Robin. What about a story, I said. Could you very sweetly tell Winnie the Pooh one? I suppose I could, I said. What sort of stories does he like? About himself, because he's that sort of bear. Oh, I see. So could you very sweetly? I'll try, I said. So I tried. Once upon a time, a very long time ago now, about last Friday, Winnie the Pooh lived in a forest all by himself under the name of Sanders. What does under the name mean? asked Christopher Robin. It means he had the name over the door in gold letters and lived under it. Winnie the Pooh wasn't quite sure, said Christopher Robin. Now I am, said a growly voice. Then I will go on, said I. One day when he was out walking, he came to an open place in the middle of the forest. And in the middle of the place there was a large oak tree, and from the top of that tree there came a loud buzzing noise. Winnie the Pooh sat down at the foot of the tree, put his head between his paws, and began to think. First of all, he said to himself, that buzzing noise means something. You don't get a buzzing noise like that. Just buzzing and buzzing without its meaning something. If there's a buzzing noise, somebody's making a buzzing noise. And the only reason for making the buzzing noise that I know of is because you're a bee. Then he thought another long time and said, and the only reason for being a bee that I know of is making honey. And then he got up and said, and the only reason for making honey is so I can eat it. So he began to climb the tree. He climbed and he climbed and he climbed. And as he climbed, he sang a little song to himself. And it went like this. Isn't it funny how a bear likes honey? Buzz, buzz, buzz. I wonder why he does. Then he climbed a little further and a little further. And then just a little further. By that time, he thought of another song. It's a very funny thought that, if bears were bees, they'd build their nests at the bottom of trees. And that being so, if bees were bears, we shouldn't have to climb up all these stairs. He was getting rather tired by this time, so that is why he sang a complaining song. He was nearly there now, and if he just stood on that branch, crack! Oh, help! said Pooh, as he dropped ten feet onto the branch below him. If only I hadn't, he said, as he bounced twenty feet onto the next branch. You see, what I meant to do, he explained as he turned head over heels and crashed onto another branch thirty feet below. What I meant to do, of course, it was rather, he admitted, as he slithered very quickly through the next six branches. It all comes, I suppose, he decided, as he said goodbye to the last branch, spun round three times, and flew gracefully into a gorse bush. It all comes of liking honey so much. Oh, help. He crawled out of the goose bush, brushed the prickles from his nose, and began to think again. And the first person he thought of was Christopher Robin. Was that me, said Christopher Robin, in an awed voice, hardly daring to believe it? That was you. Christopher Robin said nothing, but his eyes got larger and larger, and his face got pinker and pinker. So Winnie the Pooh went round to his friend Christopher Robin, who lived behind a green door in another part of the forest. Good morning, Christopher Robin, he said. Good morning, Winnie the Pooh, said you. I wonder if you've got such a thing as a balloon about you. A balloon? Yes, 
I just said to myself coming along, I wonder if Christopher Robin has such a thing of, as a balloon about him. I just said it to myself, thinking of balloons and wondering. What do you want a balloon for, you said. Winnie the Pooh looked round to see that nobody was listening, put his paw to his mouth, and said in a deep whisper, Honey. But you don't get honey with balloons. I do, said Pooh. Well, it just happened that you had been to a party the day before at the house of your friend Piglet, and you had balloons at the party. You had a big green balloon, and one of Rabbit's relations had a big blue one and had left it behind, being really too young to go to a party at all, and so you had brought the green one and the blue one home with you. Which one would you like, you asked Pooh. He put his head between his paws and thought very carefully. It's like this, he said. When you go after honey with a balloon, the great thing is not to let the bees know you're coming. Now, if you have a green balloon, they might think you are only part of the tree and not notice you. And if you have a blue balloon, they might think you are only part of the sky and not notice you. The question is, which is most likely? Wouldn't they notice you underneath the balloon, you asked? They might or they might not, said Winnie the Pooh. You can never tell with bees. He thought for a moment and said, I shall try to look like a small black cloud. That will deceive them. Then you had better have the blue balloon, you said, and it was so decided. Well, you both went out with the blue balloon and you took your gun with you, just in case, as you always did. And Winnie the Pooh went to a very muddy place that he knew of and rolled around until he was black all over. And then, when the balloon was blown up as big as big, and you and Pooh were both holding onto the string, you let go suddenly, and Pooh Bear floated gracefully up into the sky and stayed there, level with the top of the tree, and about 20 feet away from it. Hooray! you shouted. Isn't that fine? shouted Winnie the Pooh down to you. What do I look like? You look like a bear holding onto a balloon, he said. Not, said Pooh anxiously, not like a small black cloud in the blue sky. Not very much. Ah, well, perhaps from up here it looks different. And as I say, you can never tell with bees. There was no wind to blow him nearer the tree, so he stayed there. He could see the honey, he could smell the honey, but he couldn't quite reach the honey. And after a little while, he called down to you. Christopher Robin, he said in a loud whisper. Hello. I think the bees suspect something. What sort of thing? I don't know, but something tells me they're suspicious. Perhaps they think that you're after their honey. It may be that you can never tell with bees. There was another little silence, and then he called down to you again. Christopher Robin? Yes? Have you an umbrella in your house? I think so. I wish you would bring it out here and walk up and down with it and look up at me every now and, every now and then and say, tut tut, it looks like rain. I think if you did that, it would help the deception which we are trying to practice on these bees. Well, you laughed to yourself, silly old bear, but you didn't say it aloud because you were so fond of him and you went home for your umbrella. Oh, there you are, called down Winnie the Pooh. As soon as you got back to the tree, I was beginning to get anxious. I have discovered the bees are now definitely suspicious. Shall I put my umbrella up, you said. Yes, but wait a moment. We must be practical. The important bee to deceive is the queen bee. Can you see which is the queen bee from down there? No. A pity. Well, now, if you walk up and down with your umbrella, saying, tut tut, it looks like rain, I shall do what I can by singing a little cloud song, such as a cloud might sing. Go. So while you walked up and down and wondered if it would rain, Winnie the Pooh sang this song. How sweet to be a cloud floating in the blue. Every little cloud always sings aloud. How sweet to be a cloud floating in the blue. It makes him very proud to be a little cloud. The bees were still buzzing as suspiciously as ever. Some of them, indeed, left their nests and flew all around the cloud as it began the second verse of a song. And one bee sat down on the nose of the cloud for a moment 
and then got up again. Christopher, ow, Robin, called out the cloud. Yes? I have just been thinking, and I've come to a very important decision. These are the wrong sort of bees, are they? Quite the wrong sort. So I should think that they would make the wrong sort of honey, shouldn't you? Would they? Yes, so I think I shall come down. How? asked you. Looney the Pooh hadn't thought about this. If he let go of the string, he would fall, bump. And he didn't like the idea of that. So he thought for a long time, and then he said, Christopher Robin, you must shoot the balloon with your gun. Have you got your gun? Of course I have, you said. But if I do that, it will spoil the balloon, you said. But if you don't, said Pooh, I shall have to let go. And that would spoil me. When he put it like this, you saw how it was. And you aimed very carefully at the balloon and fired. Ow, said Pooh. Did I miss? you asked. You didn't exactly miss, said Pooh, but you missed the balloon. I'm so sorry, you said, and you fired again. And this time you hit the balloon, and the air came slowly out, and Winnie the Pooh floated down to the ground. But his arms were so stiff from holding onto the string of the balloon all that time that they stayed up straight in the air for more than a week. And whenever a fly came and settled on his nose, he had to blow it off. And I think, but I'm not sure, that that is why he was always called Pooh. Is that the end of the story? asked Christopher Robin. That's the end of that one. There are others. Well, Pooh and me? And Piglet and Rabbit and all of you. Don't you remember? I do remember. And then when I try to remember, I forget. That day when Pooh and Piglet tried to catch the half a lump, they didn't catch it, did they? No. Pooh couldn't because he hasn't any brain. Did I catch it? Well, that comes into the story. Christopher Robin nodded. I do remember, he said. Only Pooh doesn't very well. So that's why he likes having it told to him again and again. Because then it's a real story and not just a remembering. That's just how I feel, I said. Christopher Robin gave a deep sigh, picked his bear up by the leg, and walked off to the door, trailing Pooh behind him. At the door, he turned and said, Coming to see me have my bath? I might, I said. It didn't hurt him when I shot him, did it? Not a bit. He nodded and went out, and in that moment, I heard Winnie the Pooh, bump, 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 going up the stairs behind him. That's an excerpt from Winnie the Pooh. And for now, we're going to tell you what each of these numbers mean and the dare that goes along with them. You ready? Let's do it. All right, so number one, the loser cleans the winner's car in a Speedo. Number two, the winner shaves a drawing of their choice into the loser's leg hair. Number three, the loser makes a fancy meal for the winner wearing only an apron and boxers. Number four, the loser has to do a hot wings mukbang. Uh, number five, similar. Loser has to do a spicy Thai food mukbang. Number six, loser has to wear long nails and type out a page of the book that we just read. Uh, number seven, the winner writes a permanent marker message or drawing on the loser. Number eight, the winner sprays the loser in the face with water for three minutes. <laughs> that was a little AKA waterboarding? Water, yeah, it's a little water torture, but it's okay. Number, it's for, it's for the people. Number nine, the winner gives the loser a spot A. Ooh, and number 10 is a draw. Yeah, so that just means nobody has to do anything. So there are 10 slots, and each time that we do a dare, we're gonna have an open slot. So put in the comments below what you think would be a good dare to add to the list. Again, we're not going to spin the wheel until Friday, so make sure you get your votes in. All right. So we hope you all have a good night. And vote Mark. That's all I have. Vote Alan. All right. Good night.